So on July 26th, 1981, Donnie Brasco disappears from the mob, returns to the FBI. He receives a $500 bonus for all the years of risking his life. 500 bucks. So there wasn't any great reward here. All right, later on, you know, you know, he got a movie, he got a book deal, but you know, who knew that that was coming? He didn't know that. He did all of that for 500 bucks. I'll walk in redemption. Hey everyone, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well. Hope the new year started off great for everybody. And uh, it's good to have you back. It's the second video for 2024. Everything is blessed on this end. And as always, I give God all the praise, honor, glory, and thanksgiving for that. And we'll continue that for the rest of my life. And uh, yeah, I hope it started off well for all of you. And just a couple of quick things. Uh, January 25th, myself, Mike Tyson, Chaz Palmateri, Remade Men, Beacon Theater, we're going to be there. Ticketmaster, I think you can get the tickets, still some. I think VIPs are almost sold out, but you can check it out. Uh, looking forward to that. A lot of you have asked me about the canvas that I showed last week, and so many people are interested in owning that, having that. We're working on it. Stay tuned. It's a unique piece. It's magnificent. You're never going to see anything like that again. I doubt it. The artist is magnificent. We're working on it. So stay tuned. We're going to see if we can make some available on a limited basis. You know, I told you I'm going to be doing some mob stories. We've got a lot of diverse things happening uh, and happening and planned for this coming 2024. But I wanted to start off with uh, something I think is very, very interesting. And that is um, a story about my good friend Joe Pistone. Obviously, you know him as Donnie Brasco. Now, some people are going to say, oh, you know, Joe Pistone, he was an ex-FBI agent, retired FBI agent. Yes, he was. Anybody that saw Donnie Brasco, you know the story. It was a great movie. I still think that was uh, Pacino's best role as Lefty Guns, Lefty Ruggiero, somebody I knew fairly well. And uh, he was terrific in that movie, terrific. And it was a great movie, but it doesn't tell the whole story. Now, I've interviewed Joe. We sat down on this, and he's interviewed me on his platform. I'm going to be honest with you. He's become a dear friend. I like the guy very much. Some people say, come on, Michael. He was an FBI agent. He put so many guys away. That's true. But Joe Pistone was doing his job. He was doing his job. He was an FBI agent. He was probably or absolutely was the most successful undercover agent to e ever infiltrate, you know, my former life. He just did his job better than we did ours. And people, let me tell you this, you know, I grew up hating law enforcement, hating the police, hating the government, but not because I was taught that way. It was because I loved my dad. They were around us all the time. They were harassing my father, harassing the family, I thought, you know, putting my father in jail, arresting him several times. So I grew up with that mentality. When I got into the life, we weren't, you know, just always, uh, you know, disrespectful to the FBI and to law enforcement. We understood they had a job to do. All we ever said to them was, don't frame us. Do your job. We're on one side, you're on the other. Don't harass our families. Don't do anything like that. And for the most part, a lot of the guys did their job and they were respectful. There were some that did not. They crossed the line. They framed my father, no doubt about it in my mind. And they did some things that were shady, some of them. But if an agent was doing his job, we got it. We understood it. And we respected them for who they were as a person. They did their job. And in the case of Joe Pistone, Donnie Brasco, he did his job better than we did ours, better than the Bonanno family did ours. We accepted the guy. But I want to read a little about it and show you what was involved so that you understand what that guy went through. He was undercover for five years. Originally, it was a six-month deal. It ended up going five years, and he was deep, 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 deep undercover. And let me tell you this. At any point in time, had he been you know, outed, so to speak, he might have walked into a room and it would have been a tough deal for him. You know, who knows what would have happened? Would he have been killed? Would he have been beat up? Who knows what would have happened? I don't know. But it could have been a serious uh, problem for him, obviously. But he knew that every single day that he was involved with these guys, every single day. So it took, uh, you know, an amount of courage to do that. He was a different kind of guy and to do it so well. But let me read out of this book, and I've read something out of this book before, and you can consider this kind of like a Mob Movie Monday, except that I'm going to be reading stuff and giving you my perspective. Bill O'Reilly, uh, Killing the Mob. It's a great book. There's good information here. Bill O'Reilly is a brilliant guy. Yes, he's conservative. Doesn't matter if you like him or not. He writes good books, and he's got a great co-author, uh, Martin Dugard. I'm sure that does a lot of the research, and they do a good job. 
So uh, I'm going to read something out of this about Joe Pistone that you didn't see in the movie and that you don't know, and it'll kind of give you some insight as to what it takes to become an undercover agent, a really undercover agent. And look, I had undercover operations on me, so I knew a guy also that did a good job. Um, you know, fortunately, it didn't go anywhere, uh, but he did a good job. But let me read this. It's the spring of 1976 when Joe Pistone volunteers to expose the mob. He'd been an FBI agent for almost seven years with a wife and three daughters. He was living in New York City. Never before has the Bureau successfully placed an agent inside the Mafia. So remember this. Prior to Joe Bistone going undercover, there was never an agent that ever went inside our life before. He was the first. And Pistone's chances of success in that clandestine world were very slim. True. And yet, if ever there is an ideal candidate to pull this off, it's Joe Pistone. Now, why are they saying that? He had all the makings of what a mob guy should be, so his cover was really good. Let me read about it. The special agent grew up in Patterson, New Jersey. A lot of mob guys around there. A street guy in his own words. He hung out in mob-run social halls and witnessed mafia life firsthand. I knew how wise guys acted, he will write in his autobiography. I knew the mentality. I knew the things to do and not to do. Keep your mouth shut at certain times. Don't get involved in things that don't concern you. Now, one thing is, is, uh, is interesting. He grew up around all of these mob guys, but that's not who he wanted to be. He didn't aspire to be in the mob. For some reason, he went in a different direction. Maybe he had good parents. I don't know. We never got into that. Maybe they brought him up in a different way, not to you know, get near uh, you know, mob guys or, or at least not to follow in their footsteps. He went the other way. Very interesting. Pistone brings skills to his job, special skills. He speaks fluent Italian. Very important. Not all mob guys spoke Italian, but for him to speak Italian, it's a little more validation, no doubt. He was born into a family of Sicilian heritage. Obviously important. He looks the part, powerfully built at six feet tall, 180 pounds with broad shoulders. Yes, he is. High forehead and the tough streetwise confidence of a man who can handle himself, handle himself under pressure. On the surface, Joe Pistone easily passes as a mob foot soldier. I got to tell you, I was at a conference with uh, all the pro sports. It was a security conference, and I was there with Joe Pistone. And this was after, obviously. We sat and we answered questions. And when I got up off the table with Joe, I said, Joe, you know, the way you respond, you could be the mob guy. I said, maybe they can mistake me for the FBI agent. Who knows? But you could be the mob guy. You actually are that guy. And he laughed. And he said, well, Mike, that's why I was able to make it all those years. But um, the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover rarely used undercover agents. The director believed they might be compromised in the criminal world full of vice and money. So Hoover, Hoover believed, hey, I don't want to put anybody undercover because it might compromise my agent. They may want to get involved with them. They may start to do shady things. But the interesting thing, while Joe was undercover, he had to do shady things. He had to. He had to pass off as a real mob guy. He couldn't be lily white. He could not commit crimes. Uh, there was obviously a level that he would reach and he wouldn't go past, but he had to do these things in order to be accepted. However, Joe Pistone had already proved himself in a as a capable operator, having just spent two years inside a vehicle theft ring. So prior to becoming undercover in the mob, he spent two years undercover in a vehicle theft ring. It's his ability to drive an 18-wheel truck that landed Pistone that assignment. But now the stakes are far higher. The special agent must convince the ferocious Bonanno crime family to trust him with secrets, a daunting task to say the least. Is it daunting? I don't know. You know, I got to tell you, people, a lot of guys let their guard down in that life. You know, when people come around with money, you know, a lot of times people don't, they don't do their homework. They don't search. But in this case, I think they did. You know, they did go a little beyond what they normally would do. And they did search. But re listen to this. Before going undercover, Pistone spends months immersing himself into his persona as a small-time jewel thief named Donnie Brasco. That's where it came from. He attends the FBI gemology classes, learning about precious stones and how they are illegally bought and sold. So he went to school. You know, you remember the movie. He passed himself off as a, uh, you know, a gemology expert. And he went to school to actually study this so that he wouldn't get caught up. Pistone's name and employment record erased from all FBI files. They had to sanitize his record so nothing would ever come up in case our guys really did their homework. Co-workers and even good friends 
are not told of his assignment. They didn't know what he was doing. His wife and his daughters are relocated to a home in a different state with a new last name and the realization that they will not see Joe for months at a time. And even then, he will only be home for a day or so. Now imagine this. His wife had to agree to this. His wife had to say, okay, Joe, I know you're dedicated to the FBI. You're going on an assignment, which by the way, he couldn't even tell his wife and children what the assignment was. Now, Joe discussed that with me. Very, very hard. Imagine that. Imagine being with your wife, your kids, and not being able to tell them what you were doing and being away from home for so long. All right, they knew he was, she knew he was an FBI agent, but still, it's a rough assignment. At first, the family is fine. Maggie Pistone and the girls all welcome their new circumstance, but in time, uh, the strain of Pistone's job and the long periods of separation will lead Maggie to deeply resent her husband's job. Come on, how could she not? I mean, that's her husband. He's away from home, can't talk to her for months at a time. You know, she doesn't know what's going on, FBI or not. You start to get resentful for that. I mean, imagine you women that might be listening, think about it. To escape questions, his teenage daughters tell friends their parents are divorced. That's how separated he was from the family. Kids didn't know what to say, told them they were divorced. He will miss all the family birthdays, all of them, and graduations. Graduations? Making matters even worse, Pistone is not allowed to tell his family about his assignment, leaving them completely in the dark as to why he is abandoning them for such long periods of time. Look at the sacrifice the guy made. You know, and again, some people might say, come on, Michael, you know, he was undercover, he was no good, he was putting people in jail. He was doing his job. I will say that again. People, when law enforcement does their job, how can you complain? This is what they do. This is the oath that they took, okay, to uphold the law, to root out criminal activity. When a cop on the street is doing his job, do you get upset with him? Of course not. Do you call him a rat or a snitch because he's locking people up? No, he's not. Doing his job, that's what they do. When legitimate people go to the law over something ha that happens, that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to abide by the law and, you know, do what they're supposed to do. Do we like it? Not all the time, you know, but that's what they're supposed to do. The FBI gives Pistone two apartments, one in Miami and one on the Upper, sea, upper East Side of Manhattan. He also possesses under his new name, credit cards, social security identification, a driver's license, and a monthly stipend of spending money so he can look and act like a gangster. Joe Pistone is a very driven man, but he feels enormous guilt over leaving his family. He does. And he talked about that with me. Joe and I got a little bit personal. And by the way, I met Joe on the street one time. He and Tony Mira, he was with Tony at that time, came to my uh, Mazda dealership that I had in Hempstead. And I had a little business with Tony. Uh, you know, we spent some time talking and I met Joe. And uh, he was nice. You know, he didn't get involved in the conversation too much, but he was there. I don't recall too much of what happened. But I always tease Joe. I said, Joe, I'm glad I only met that one time on the street. Enjoy knowing you now. But didn't want to know you then because you were very effective in doing your job. Okay. And September 1976, Donnie Brasco goes into action. That's when this started. September 1976, I got made a year before, so I was right in the middle of it. He is on his own, unable to make immediate contact with the Bureau if things go wrong. The agent meets once a month with an FBI official who replenishes his cash, and they had to have a clandestine meeting, obviously. But as far as protection is concerned, Brasco has none. The chances of taking a bullet behind the ear are very high. The undercover operation is supposed to last six months. Instead, it continues for five perilous years. Supposed to be six months, it went on for five years. Now, why? I guess because he was doing such a good job, gathering so much intelligence, gathering so much information on organized crime, especially the Bonanno family. They just let it continue, and, and he was into it. He let it go. You got a beef, Donnie Brasco asks the mobster known as Patsy. And I'm not going to get into read all of this, but what happened is he had a beef with uh, this guy, uh, Patsy, and uh, Patsy was trying to prove that he was who he said he was. And uh, it got pretty, pretty dicey for Joe at the time. I remember him talking to me about this. Bottom line, he stood up. I think Patsy put a gun on a table and said, if the information that you give me proves to be false, this gun, you're not going to walk out of here. And, uh, and he wanted Joe to give him some information on somebody, and Joe said, no, I'm not doing it. Check it out. I'm not giving you any information. And that was a bold move on his part. Well, Patsy did check it out. As it turned out, it turned out to be verified 
whatever it was that Joe gave him at the time, so he walked out. But it was, it was dicey. They kind of put him on the spot, and he held himself well during that time. After a year of surreptitiously recording conversations and memorizing the names and license plates of New York mafioso, Donnie Brasco is finally introduced to the higher-ups in the Bonanno family. He quickly befriends Anthony Mira, that's when I met him, and Dominic Nap Napolitano, and that's uh, Sonny Black, who eventually trust him so thoroughly that his mob membership is a fait accompli. Brasco not only gets on the inside, but incredibly becomes a trusted companion of Benjamin Lefty Guns Ruggiero, a rising member of the Bonanno outfit, somebody that I knew fairly well. He was around the neighborhood that I was in and uh, knew him fairly well. And uh, yeah, he, he got very close to Lefty. He got very close to Sonny Black also. I'm telling you now, pal, you belong to me alone, Ruggiero tells Brasco as he brings him into the family. I'll die with you. Remember that uh, uh, it was said in the movie? He said, you belong to me, I'll die with you, Donnie, remember? And Brasco said, I know that. Now you are affiliated officially, Ruggiero tells him, cementing Joe Pistone as the greatest undercover agent in FBI history. No doubt that he was. Undercover for five years, I think he brought maybe a hundred guys, you know, were, uh, you know, brought to trial or at least uh, charged as a result of his investigation. A hundred guys, five years, pretty darn good as an FBI agent but one that may perish at any time. Lefty Ruggiero is a vicious killer known to have at least 26 confirmed murders. Known by who? I don't know. You know, the FBI says that. They put out these numbers. They said my father had 35 or 40. I don't know who they are. You know, they never named them, but, you know, I think they always embellish and exaggerate. But there's no question that, you know, Lefty was a tough guy. Brasco's initial role is to assist Ruggiero's bookmaking operation. That's kind of the deal again. We didn't see that in the movie. Uh, but that's what his initial role was. But in time, their friendship grows so strong that Brasco dines often at the Ruggiero home in Manhattan. We saw that. Remember that? You know, uh, on Mars, men are the best cooks. Remember? He throws the salt over his back. He burns the, uh, the chicken that he was cooking. Good scene. He counsels Lefty in dealing with the mobster's stepson who is addicted to heroin. We remember that, don't we? And it's unbelievable. The undercover operation that it had on me with Victor Guerrero, Victor Quintana, my brother at the time was around this guy and my brother was getting in trouble with some drugs. And uh, the FBI agent at that time, Victor, could have put him in trouble. You know, my brother was doing some bad things. Instead, he came to me and he told me, you know, and, he, and again, I didn't know he was an undercover agent, obviously, but he told me. Now, he could have put my brother in trouble, same way Joe Pistone could have put uh, Lefty's son in trouble, but he didn't. That wasn't the focus of the, of, of the investigation, and Joe had a heart, the same way Victor had a heart, you know? Sometimes uh, they just want to stay on what they, even though they're seeing a crime, they're going to overlook it, you know, for the, for the other purpose that they're involved in. So, and I appreciated that with Victor, because he could have put my brother in trouble, but he didn't. And the same here with, uh, with Joe Pistone. Uh, he counseled Ruggiero himself is a gambling addict. Yes, big gambler. And Brasco covers some of his debts. Donnie Brasco covered some of his debts. Remember, you know, in the movie that uh, Pacino was always taking money from Donnie Brasco? Probably the same thing here. That's how it happened in reality. But he was actually covering his debts to help him out. On a daily basis, Donnie Brasco's life becomes a long sequence of mafia social clubs, bars, parties, and card games. Oh, my God. I can't tell you how much time I spent in a social club, and honestly, I didn't like it. I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy playing cards. Me, I wanted to get out there. I'm looking to make money and looking to do things. I didn't want to, but you had to. You had to pay your dues. When Andrew Russo was my capo, I had to go there on Carroll Street, the social club, sit there for hours, you know, if he wanted me to drive him someplace, do something. All right, when I got a little bit more established and I became a soldier that was earning, I had to come and pay my respects and my dues and all of that, but I didn't have to hang out there. And then later on as a capo, obviously I didn't have to do that, but always had to come in, check in, you know, pay my respects. Jerry Lang was my underboss. Junior was in jail most of the time. Had to check in with Jerry all the time, but the social clubs, and yeah, we used to go out. Look, I was out six nights a week. Different club, different bar, different lounge, you know, not on Sundays, but the other six nights we were out. That was our life at that point in time. Okay. As a wise guy, you can lie, you can cheat, you can steal, you can kill people legitimately, Ruggiero tells Brasco. Remember that. You can do any damn thing you want. Nobody can say anything about it. Who wouldn't want to be a wise guy? Lefty was, 
you know, in love with being who he was. There's no question about it, you know. It's like the line in Goodfellas. From the time I was a kid, all I ever wanted to be was a wise guy. Same thing with Lefty. That's who he was. Uh, he made no bones about it. And, uh, you know, on the street, he was known to be a good guy. No doubt. Through it all, Donnie Brasco's friendship with Letty Ruggiero grows deeper and deeper. The two men became so close that the mobster even asked the special agent to serve at best man for his 1977 wedding to his second wife, Louise. <laughs> Let me tell you, Brasco had to do a great job in order to become that close. Unbelievable. So listen, again, got to applaud the guy for what he did. In February 1980, the connection between Brasco and Ruggiero escalates into a dangerous situation. That means Donnie Brasco would have to execute someone in service to the Bonanno family. The FBI, of course, could never sanction that. Agents are prohibited from committing acts of violence other than in self-defense. The undercover operation is now in its fifth year, but problems are starting to accumulate. One March afternoon, Brasco and Ruggiero are sitting, listen to this, you saw this in the movie, in a Miami restaurant with Lefty flipping through a copy of Time magazine. The mobster notices an unusual photograph of a yacht named Left Hand. The vessel is part of a story about the FBI and its undercover assets. Several months prior, remember in the movie, Donnie Brasco had used that same yacht to entertain a group of mafioso and their wives in Biscayne Bay. Ruggiero was part of the outing. The killer looks up from the magazine, immediately demands an explanation. Brasco is caught by surprise, but is glib enough to say he knows nothing about any FBI involvement with the yacht. Maybe Brasco says he was scammed. Ruggiero is skeptical, but he puts the matter aside, at least for the moment. You know, uh, that should have been a real red flag to Lefty at that point in time. But again, their relationship had gotten so close. They didn't, he didn't assume that this was, uh, you know, that, that Joe Pistone was doing anything wrong or that he was anything but his good friend. You know, but that was a, a real red flag that uh, he didn't miss it, but maybe he didn't delve into it. But you know what? It was too late at that point anyhow. There had been five years of undercover work. Wouldn't have mattered at that point. Joe Pistone would later write that mobsters are thieves first and not primarily an organization of murderers. You know, that's interesting because I've said this in the past. You know, when we took our oath to Omerta, it was an oath of silence. I've said this many times. It wasn't an oath to lie, steal, kill, cheat, and murder. That's not what the oath was. And that's not what we did on a daily basis, okay? Did we do it? Did we engage in criminal activity? Of course. But did we take an oath to become a murderer? No. Did we say if we were called upon to do something, we would do it? Yes. You know, so there's a difference, and Joe kind of validates that. We're not out there murdering people every single day, and this isn't a major course of business. And most guys, you know, uh, Roy DeMeo excluded maybe, Greg Scarpa maybe excluded. Most guys, that's not what they wanted to do. That was a last resort. Understand that. But in the midst of his new life comes a stark reminder of what happens when the mob turns on one of its own. On March 21st, 1980, two weeks after the left hand in incident in Miami shatters the agent's belief that he is invincible, a major mafia hit becomes news. And that's uh, Angelo Bruno. He was assassinated. He was killed. You know, he was, uh, he was kind of the quiet Don. He wasn't a guy that wanted violence, but he was a uh, boss in the Philadelphia crew at that time. Uh, I was in, in jail uh, later on with Salvatore Gambino, who was under Bruno at one point in time. Uh, talked to me a lot about him, liked him very much. He was supposedly a good boss that didn't want to be involved in violence if he didn't have to. Uh, so that started to get into Pistone's head. He started to see, hey, violence is real here. And then you saw that part in a movie when three couples from the Bonanno family uh, were executed, brutally executed. You saw that. It happened there. So things started to really fall apart and the investigation uh, was pulled. Let me just read this part. The Banana Gang War spelled the beginning of the end for Pistone as a mob undercover. But before he could extricate himself, the family ordered him to kill a man named Bruno Indelicato. I knew Bruno. He was on trial with me. Once that was accomplished, Donnie Brasco would be a made man. In his time as a member of the Bonanno family, Donnie Brasco has committed all manners of crimes, ranging from loan sharking to racketeering, but murder, too much. They wouldn't let him do that. So on July 26th, 1981, Donnie Brasco disappears from the mob, returns to the FBI. He receives a $500 bonus for all the years of risking his life. 500 bucks. So there wasn't any great reward here. All right, later on, you know, 
you know, he got a movie, he got a book deal, but you know, who knew that that was coming? He didn't know that. Uh, he did all of that for 500 bucks. 33 days later, Lefty Ruggiero is taken into custody by federal authorities for his own protection. True. I think he was driving in a car and they stopped him and they took him in for his own protection. The feds told Ruggiero a contract has been taken out on his life because of his association with Donnie Brasco. And uh, that's true. You know, I know that for a fact that that happened and uh, they actually saved his life. I believe, I don't want to say this is a fact, but I believe he might have been going somewhere at that point in time where it could have been the end of his life. I don't know that for a fact. It's what I heard, maybe, but whatever, they did pick him up. Dominic Napolitano, his fate is sealed. Sonny Blake, you saw that in the movie as Lefty Ruggiero, but obviously that wasn't true. Didn't happen that way. But listen to this, on August 17th, actually, rather than read this, I'm going to read something else about Dominic. I just want to, you know, people, when I look back, there's a lot of horrible things about that life, people. A lot of horrible things. And I want, to, I want to read this to you so that you understand some of these horrible things. On August 17th, 1981, Napolitano was summoned to a meeting in a Bonanno associate, Ron Filicomo's home in Ettenville, Staten Island, which was the home of Filicomo's parents. Anticipating that he would be killed, Sonny Black thought he was going to be killed as a result of him being called into this meeting. Napolitano gave his jewelry to his favorite bartender. You saw in the movie, Lefty was putting it on the counter in his house. Not the way it happened. Along with the keys to his apartment so that his pet pigeons could be cared for. He loved his pigeons. I remember that. I knew Sonny Black. Nice guy for me. Bonanno Campo, Frank Lino, I knew him too. And Steve Canone, didn't know him, drove Napolitano to the Filicomo's house. The three men were greeted at the door by Frank Coppa, knew him, who told them the conference was to be held in the basement. As Napolitano descended the basement stairs, Coppa slammed the basement door shut, signaling for Lino to shove Napolitano down the stairs. As two killers, Robert Lino Sr. and Filicomo, were waiting at the foot of the stairwell, Napolitano was pushed down the stair, was shot and grazed by Lino, Lino Sr. When his gun failed to fire a subsequent shot, Napolitano told them, hit me one more time and make it good, to which Filicomo responded by firing several 38 caliber rounds, killing him. People, was that justified? I don't think so. Sonny Black did not know that... Uh, you know, Donnie Brasco was undercover. Lefty didn't know it. The whole Bonanno family didn't know it. Everybody on the street was fooled by it. Came to visit me. I didn't know it. Not that I was part of it, but I didn't know it. He just fooled everybody for five years. He did his job that well. Should Sonny Black have died for that? No. Did he have to? No. Is there a rule that says if you bring somebody around like that, that you're going to die? No. I think it was unjust. I think it's one of the horrors of that life. Let me tell you something more about Sonny Black. People say, why did he go? I want to tell you something. I had that experience. I told you I'm not going to be redundant where I was walked into a room, didn't know if I was going to walk out again. People said to me, Michael, why didn't you cut and run? And I say this, it wasn't heroic. It was more robotic. We become so entrenched in that life that we say, okay, you know what? If this is it, this is it. Sonny Black, maybe in his thoughts, said, I have nowhere to go. I have nowhere to run. I screwed up. I'm going to take my medicine. Was it the right thing to do? I don't know. You know, I don't know, man. Uh, but I got to tell you, I give him credit for doing it. There's no question. Here's a man that was uh, courageous. Some people might call him stupid. I call it kind of courageous to walk into that situation. Napolitano's girlfriend, Judy, later contacted Bestone and told him shortly before his death, Napolitano had told her that he bore no ill will towards Bestone, knowing that Bestone was only doing his job and that if anyone responsible for taking him down, it was glad it was Pistone. She said that Napolitano really loved Pistone and was upset when he found out he was an agent. Napolitano could not believe that Pistone was an agent because of the things we had done together, the conversations that we'd had, the feelings that we've had. Man, that is tough. That is really, really tough. You know, they became so friendly. And I'm going to tell you something, too. This broke up Joe Pistone, too. I mean, he knew he was doing the right thing. He didn't want Napolitano to be killed. He didn't want that at all. He didn't know that that was going to happen. Yes, he knew that, you know, that there was jeopardy there, of course. But he certainly, you know, was regretful of it. He didn't want that to happen. He didn't want it to happen to Lefty. It's part of the horrors of the job when you go undercover and you're in a situation like that, really. 
But Napolitano, to tell uh, Judy, hey, you know what? I understand he was just doing his job, which is exactly what I said in the beginning. He was doing his job. And you know, you can't fault somebody for that. And Joe Pistone did his job a lot better than all the guys involved with him on the street did theirs. And you know, the sad thing is, um, you know, his body wasn't found for, I think, about a year later. And uh, hands were cut off. I mean, it, it was terrible where they found him. Uh, and I don't think they were even sure that it was him because, you know, the body was badly decomposed, whatever. Uh, but it's a sad story, you know. Um, and I think some of this you probably didn't know wasn't put in the movie. And if you didn't read Joe's book, you didn't read it. So what's my point in all of this? You know, um, again, there is a division on the street. Division. You understand when a cop, a law enforcement person is doing their job, hey, do your job. If you do it better than me, I get it. You win, we lose. If we do it better than you, then we continue, we do what I do, and you lose. That's just how it goes. It's the way of the street. We don't like to be framed and stuff like that because the government should never be able to violate the law in order to catch the criminals. The government has all the weapons, all the tools. They have everything going for them. If they can't do it the right way, then they shouldn't do it. They shouldn't do it because that's when you have a problem. That's when the government becomes weaponized and can go after its enemies anytime they choose. And you know what, people? It's happening now. Things that we worried about back then are happening now. This administration is weaponizing law enforcement to go after their political enemies and to go after people that disagree with their agenda. Open your eyes. It's happening now. And this is dangerous. And it needs to stop for the benefit of every American citizen okay, in this country and for those to come. That's just the way it is. That's what I believe. I'll die believing that because that's the right way to think. Now, let me tell you, you know, these are some of the horrors of that life, people. And um, it's a sad story. It really is. It's a sad story. But I'm giving Joe Pistone his due. Again, he is a dear friend, somebody I got to like very much. Um, you know, and we were on opposite sides at one time, but I get what he did and he gets what I did. And hey, you know what? Life goes on, people. And you know what? You try to make changes in your life. And people that might have been your enemies at one point are now friends or relationships. It all depends on circumstances and situations. So that's my story with Joe Pistone. And by the way, you know, I have, I've never met Bill O'Reilly, never spoke to him, but he writes some good books. Read this book. You'll enjoy it. You can probably get it on Amazon anywhere. But uh, he does his research and uh, he does a good job. There's a lot in this thing that in this book that uh, that I found very interesting. Some things I knew, some things I didn't know. But look it up. You'll enjoy it. And that's it for today, my friends. How do I always leave you? Same way. Never going to change. Not in the new year. Not in any year. Be safe. And you know what? Let's pray that this year um, is a safe year for all of us here on our homeland. Let's just pray because... Everything that's coming over the border, we have no idea, people. We don't. Just look at the news every single day, the real news that tells you what's really going on. Be safe. Be healthy. Hey, it's the new year. Everybody's packed in the gym. You know, for the next couple of weeks, right into February, we're going to see everybody working out, trying to lose that weight, going over, the, you know, this New Year's resolution that they're going to really, you know, take care of themselves. And by March, end of February goes right back to normal. That happens every year. So just uh, don't make a resolution you're not going to keep. You know, be realistic about it. And yes, and I really mean this, and I mean this for all my followers, all your families, all my friends, everybody on YouTube, all the guys uh, that we've spoken about. Uh, may God bless every one of you, you and your families. And yes, I will see you next time. Take care.